Martonic here with East Meets West Hunt Podcast. And I've already done a bunch of the Mountain Buck Scouting Series talking about how to scout online and to be able to find different areas. I want to break it into the different seasons and how you're going to be hunting those. And the first one I want to start off with is the early season. So when you're hunting in the early season, it can be extremely difficult in the big woods and mountainous terrain, whether you're in Pennsylvania, New York, West Virginia, Virginia, Southern Ohio, North Carolina, wherever that might be throughout the Appalachian Range. So with that being said, if you do know where the primary food source is and having a decent idea where a particular buck may be bedding, then it could be a really excellent time of the year to be able to capitalize when they are the most predictable. The first thing I look at when it comes to trying to figure out deer for the early season and well any season really is comes down to e-scouting so again go back to the first videos that i had to understand the features some of the things i look for to give you the basics i'm going to dive specifically into early season for this video so as discussed in those earlier episodes deer love to work edges of both terrain and vegetation features that can be identified on the onyx hunt app and the web map these edges will hold true throughout all of the seasons, but how the deer are gonna utilize them can be completely different depending on what time of year that it is. In the early season, vegetation can be thick throughout, and the defined edges aren't really as defined as they are later in the year when the leaves have fallen off the trees. So that makes narrowing down bedding pretty difficult when it comes down to vegetation in itself because it's really thicker everywhere. They can be changing up their bedding quite a bit. But with that being said, you don't need to overcomplicate things. Deer in the mountains and the big woods can often bed in places that seem somewhat unpredictable and without reason, very random. Although I'm sure that there is a reason that I just haven't figured out, there, I don't like to focus on that random. I wanna focus on things that are giving me the best odds. Anything that I say in here is definitely not something that you'd be like, this is what I follow, it's gonna work every time. It might not, it might only work 20% of the time, it might be less, but I wanna find the things that have the best odds. And with that being said, there are a couple of areas that I keep in mind for early season bedding. Older logging cuts, 10 plus years old, they're really good because they have a visual advantage, they can see underneath some of the trees, but they're still, it's still thick enough that they feel secure. Um, some of the old gas wells or openings and logging pads within those those older cuts they like to be on the edge of those where they can see out a ways but also have that thick cover to kind of be able to retreat into in addition to those logging cuts the points of ridges i mean this goes for just about any time of the year but bucks like to have the visual advantage they can lay down on um, you know, a semi-flat spot, might only be just as big as their body, but where they have a, a steep drop off down below that they can see you know, maybe upwards of 100 to 150 yards down below them. Here's a great example of a buck bed out on this point. So what we have here is got a bed right here and it's kind of out off the edge of this point and you look down over look at that view he's got a good visual down over he can you can see a trail that goes down off the edge or he can exit quickly if someone comes up behind him walking up this gas well road it's a really good spot and on the way into this bed I had found well, a group of three big scrapes and then also one big lone one big licking branch snapped off everything is right there and so as he exits this bed and heads up there's some oaks that are back this way you can see a scrape that he hits or scrape line and that's where i would plan to attack at this spot is uh, the group of three scrapes is probably about 120 yards away or so and I think that's just far enough away that you're not gonna spook them. If you're coming in for an evening hunt or if it was a morning hunt, I'd hunt over this closer scrape that's only 50 yards away. And that's easily identified on a map. And usually when you're marking these on the map, you're not going to generally find the, you know, 
a specific bed. I rarely mark a spot and there's a bed right there. But a lot of times on that topography line, you can find those. And I'm not trying to find specific beds as much as I'm trying to find the bedding topography line, the line that they're liking to bet on where they're able to see. So when I dive into the map to locate some of these areas, here's a spot I picked on a map that kind of caught my eye. So first of all, I'm going to look at the logging cuts. So this one here is um, a particular, looks like kind of a newer cut depending on the age of this photo. So this wouldn't be it. But if you would pretend that this was an older cut, as you're zooming in, you can see some openings. So right here is an opening. Up in the center here, you have another opening. And over here, you have another one. The edges of those can be great for buck bedding because they're able to look out into those and be able to see with their wind coming at their back and thick cover to their back. In addition to that, the edges of these cuts. And in this particular spot, it's really great because they it's right on the edge of terrain too. So they could be bedding. I'm just going to throw an example here out. They could be bedding out on, say, this spot right in here. And they're able, they're able to be right there and be able to have a visual advantage out in front of them and also have that security cover to their back. Now, it's more difficult to, I, I don't like to focus on specific bedding in these types of areas because there's so much that's all through here. So I would confirm that with trail cameras, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But where are more easier places to be able to identify the bedding is out where the terrain is on the points of the ridges. So they love bedding on the points of these ridges because they can have the, the dominant wind, the prevailing wind, coming at their back and over and utilize the daytime thermals to be able to cover each of their areas so they're, they're almost foolproof in that area. So as I'm looking here out towards the point of the ridge, so this is a south facing slope, which a lot of the times um, you'll have some of those, if you're hunting a cold front, anything like that, you're gonna have more northerly westerly winds, especially here in Pennsylvania. So I like to focus on those areas. As I'm going out, I'm looking for areas with steep drop off, so where the, the topography line is starting to close up. And so, for example, right here on this line looks like a good spot. You have a, a drop off here, um, a little bit flatter up above, um, but it's still down over the edge from the top of the hill. So, I would mark that as a potential buck bedding location. And then as I go out further on this point, it even gets more defined. So you're going out, so that might be more of a easterly type wind that he would bed in that location. But when you get out here, look at this, like this spot right here, this hard line at 1700 feet, a little bit flatter and a steeper drop off, able to see. So again, I would mark this to be able to go in and check out. If the ridge has oak trees that are producing or black cherries from the cherry trees that are dropping in late September, early October, these places can be fire. But also, you know, as I was talking about those south facing slopes, also pay attention to the north facing slopes, especially if you have warmer weather. Say it's late September, early October, and the weather's getting up in the 70s, you're hunting in the evening, they might like those cooler faces. So those north facing slopes could be even better during that time of year. As I mentioned, food sources are key during this season. They can be tougher to spot on a map than the other features just because it depends on the map and when it was taken, like as far as the photo, if it was taken in the summer, a little bit harder to be able to identify. Um, even in the winter time, you can see the vegetation differences a little bit, but not necessarily what type of trees they are. So one thing that, that I've found is, is typically your hardwoods, which include oak, cherry, maple, birch, and others are light green in the spring imagery, darker green during the summer months, which you mostly find on Onyx, and oranges in the fall. Oak trees typically change colors in the fall later than, they, than the maples and birch and some of the other ones. 
So if you're lucky, you can actually pull up Google Earth Pro on your, your desktop version. It's just a free version to add there. I, I, don't, I don't like to use Google Earth Pro as a standalone, but I do like to use it as an addition to Onyx and being able to see that. So to be able to kind of show you a little bit about what I'm looking for here. So on Google Earth Pro, if you go in under the settings and turn on the historical imagery slider, there's a lot of places online where you can find the details on how to use this. But right here, the slider bar, I'm always trying to look for a date that has around that October standpoint because that's when the leaves are changing. A lot of places you're not lucky and you're not able to find that. But like say, if you're going to the most recent imagery, watch how this changes. All right, so this one dropped back 2012 because the, the most recent one was in 2015. See how everything's green? It's difficult to be able to tell the differences, even down at the bottom where there's hemlocks. You can't really tell that as easily. But when you jump up to October of 2015, this one has a perfect example of this. You can see in this bottom, you got this hemlocks that are running down through the bottom. So you see that different terrain feature. Up here to the top, you have the bright green trees where everything else is changing colors. There's a good chance that those are oak trees. And so the, and there's only looks like a, a patch of them out on this point and some out on this point. So those are things I'm gonna take and I'm gonna mark a waypoint or a place mark as they call it and name it oak trees, save it. And then once you go into your side bar over here, you right click, save that place as, make sure you save it as a KML file, that's what Onyx likes. Find your place where you're gonna save it to, just for here, I'm gonna save it to my desktop, save. And then you go back into Onyx and my content and be able to import select from computers says drag your KML or uh, file there. So I'm going to go over to my desktop and be able to go down and find where I have saved Oak trees, KML and open. Okay. That's there saved to my content. And that has now been added into a waypoint there. So you can go in and change it. You can make it, um, you can add a different icon to it. You can add notes to it. You can do all the features that Onyx has to be able to pull that into your phone while you're in the field. Apple trees are another food source I love to focus on. Apple trees are just about impossible to identify on the map. So e-scouting for apple trees is difficult. But there is one thing that you can look for when it comes to e-scouting for apple trees. Well, in this particular option I'm looking here, there's a spot called Apple Tree Hollow. I bet there's uh, but there's some apple trees in there. But typically what I'm looking for is a bunch of different creek bottoms or drainages that run into each other and a spot in the bottom that's open. Um, down in these bottoms, a lot of times you can find apple trees. And that's not all the time. And this is I'm talking a lot about Pennsylvania, but I've also found this in Ohio as well. So being able to go in and again, I just mark it like this. Uh, and what I'll do is mark the food source icon and keep it in red. If I were to go into the season and actually find that and there's actually apples there or it's an, actually an apple tree, I'll mark it in yellow. So that's telling me that I confirmed that spot. That's a place that actually had apple trees. Maybe I have to move it over a little bit, the icon, but it really helps me be able to identify that. And then the last thing is younger logging cuts and uh, one to four years old, they have great browse and they can be a good early season hotspot. New growth that sprouts from the ground is still very green and creates an excellent browsing food source. As you can see, it looks a little more open there. Um, typically it'll be more darker green if it's an older cut, but this one's uh, an earlier season one or one that's been cut in, in the last few years. And if you're in an area that's federally owned public land, you can turn on the logging cuts feature and be able to see that. But in this particular area, it, it is not a state owned land. And 
I'm able to kind of just be able to tell it from the, the imagery there. I love e-scouting, but honestly, to be successful in early season, you need to have boots on the ground. In the springtime, I will check these areas that I marked on the web map to confirm my thoughts on potential bedding areas and also food sources. So you can typically see acorn caps on the ground if you find a, a spot that's acorn producing. You can tell by the bark of an oak tree. You can tell by the different leaves. Say if you have uh, an oak leaf that's pointed, it's normally a red oak or one that has more rounded lobes, you're looking at a white oak. And those white oaks are money in the early season if you can find those. Newer logging cuts in the spring also kind of give you an idea how quickly that new growth is coming up and whether that would be good browsing. So even though it's in the spring, you can still kind of tell. And a lot of the late season, early season stuff um, overlap. So if you see, if you're in there and there's still snow on the ground, you see a ton of tracks some digging, some other stuff in there. It can also be a very good early season spot. So, and then the, the last thing that I pay attention to is, is pay attention to big community scrapes. I'll say that in every single one of these videos, but any big community scrapes between potential bedding and the primary food source of the area is, are the ones that I'm, I'm going to focus on the most and particularly closer to bedding more than the food source. And as I said, bedding is a giant variable and same with food sources. They can eat just about anywhere, but we're trying to look at our best odds to be able to put ourselves in that situation. Went into the valley that I had found on the map to be able to look for apple trees. So a bunch of different valleys run into this one spot. It's a wide open bottom. We have a beaver pond over here and right behind me is a group of apple trees and what's nice is i'll mark this spot on the map which actually was only about 50 yards away from where i found it on the map when i was scouting from home so mark this spot and then the important thing is to come back in right before the season even in the end of summer you can tell when the apples are on the trees to be able to see if this is a spot worth hunting to set up on apple trees if I'm in a remote spot like this, there is a good chance that the bucks might be hitting them during daylight hours. So that's where I'm gonna start. Gonna run a camera on the apple trees and be able to set up literally right over the top of them. But that is only an evening spot. That's not good for the mornings because the deer might be in here feeding and you don't wanna blow them out. So to come in, in the evening, setting up right over the food source, using the stream to walk in and not bump any deer will make it a lot less intrusive. So after I found, I found the apple tree, I found a crick crossing, I found trails that lead up to that apple tree. Now I gotta figure out how am I gonna set up? That's the important part. You can find the good sign, but you gotta figure out how to actually hunt it. So the stream is running down this way to me. The apple trees are right out here in front of me. And so with the, the way that, no matter what time of year, no matter if it's hot out or anything, these hemlocks and the crick are gonna pull these thermals downstream. So I wanna be below the, the crick crossing. Behind me, I have a beaver pond, the head end of a beaver pond. So the deer aren't gonna be crossing there. This is the, the main area to cross. This hemlock tree behind me can really keep you concealed so that when they're coming through, you're not sticking out like a sore thumb if you were in a single tree. And you really don't even need to go that high. In this specific setup, because of how the branches are, I would be only maybe eight feet at the most to be able to shoot under them, but still above the brush when they're coming out. So the trail here that crosses the stream is only about 15 yards and the furthest apple tree is 30 yards. So that's a pretty good gap for archery season. Ideally, I would like to hunt this on a northerly wind because that would be coming down this valley anyways. And also that would mean some cooler weather coming in. They were gonna wanna come out to feed earlier. But honestly, even if you did have a south wind or anything that would be less ideal these thermals are going to take care of you and be able to keep your scent concealed so honestly if it's the right time of year and i know that these apple trees are getting hit i'm going to be hunting it in the early season behind me i have a big beaver pond it's the head end of the beaver pond so i had shown in the last clip where there's the apple tree it's only about 60 yards up from here and it's extremely wide across. There's no deer that are gonna cross through that beaver pond in the deep water when they have the easy crossing point that's right up above it. 
So at the top end and the low end of beaver ponds are always good crossing areas. And when you have multiple points of the hills that are running down to the bottom, and it just makes the perfect storm for good crossing areas. You got food source, you have scrapes, uh, signpost rubs, and beaver pond funnels. It's an ideal spot to be able to, to focus on later in the year as far as during the pre-rut and the rut. And it can also be a good spot during the early season if you're focusing on the apple tree specifically. I found a community scrape here as I talked about with e-scouting. They like to be on the flat spots of benches. So behind me you have kind of a steep hill that goes up to an oak flat on the top and then it kind of teeters off to another steep edge. There seems to be some bedding out around this point a little bit further out. You I mean only about 70, 80 yards and close to that bedding in some of this beech brush and mixed with some oaks, you have this big community scrape. There's multiple licking branches. There's, I think, six of them that I've counted here from years and years of use. An old signpost rub on the tree. This spot has been used for years. And how I would hunt this specific spot is in the early season, if there's acorns up on the top, that, and assuming that the bucks would be bedding out around this point, I would hunt it in the morning. So when the bucks are leaving the food, coming back to bed, hopefully be able to catch them at that first light before they're getting ready to lay down for the day. When I'm hunting a place like this in the early season, I'm only going to really be hunting till about 10 a.m. I mean, I think most of your action is gonna be first thing in the morning for, for me personally. So I'm gonna to try to just get a good few hours in and then move along and, and scout. But, one of the things to pay attention to is when you're not having uh, you know, giant deer densities and, and buck bedding can be sporadic, I know that the bucks bed here at some point. So it might take multiple days in a row of doing that to be able to determine whether uh, this is a spot that is a fluke or if it's a spot that they're actually working during the season. By looking back at the other areas that I've covered here, so you have the apple tree, you have a community scrape, you have a signpost rub, you have a crick crossing, and you have the beaver pond here behind me with multiple valleys meeting. This spot can be utilized by moving up and down only a couple hundred yards from the early season, focusing on the food source, and the pre-rut focusing on the community scrape, and during the rut where it really ties all of these areas together. So you have basically from the end of September all the way through the end of November, uh, you can hunt this specific area a little bit differently. When I'm scouting, I'm looking for areas that have everything the deer need in one location. So they're not needing to, you know, migrate a couple ridges over if there's no oak trees because they have browse and they have apples and they have other mass crops. Or if there's no cover, you know, they got to move to different areas. This spot has all of that. It's got the cover, it's got the food, it's got the travel, it's got water everything is in this one location. Those are the types of areas I'm trying to focus my time on the most to get the most out of my season.